Good evening, Australia. Welcome to the Virtual Australian Whiskey Show. My name is Oliver Maruda. I'm from the Whiskey List and myself with David Ligoff. We are your hosts tonight. So we've got a wonderful, uh, we've got 10 Aussie distillers uh, joining us tonight. Uh, we've got our awesome virtual tasting kits. We've got the app. There's so much content to go through. We'll, we'll be going for about one, one and a half hours, two hours, depending how we'll go. We'll, we'll go explain it all in a second. But yeah, just wanted to kind of Wait, as um, more and more people are joining, you can see we're about 100 people watching the live stream already, so that, that's great. Everyone's got their emails on time. So uh, the way it's going to work tonight is um, we, we've opened up the live stream at home for everyone to watch, uh, whether or not you got a kit or not. But those lucky uh, who got out the, the, the sold-out kits, and, and you know they, they look like this, so I'll just put a picture up for those who uh, missed out on the kits. This is what they look like. you got your kits. There's a little tasting card of each of the whiskies, so um, you can see there's 18 whiskies inside. And and we'll be basically going through one whiskey per distiller tonight. Well, obviously, we'd like to go through all 19 samples, 18 plus your one bonus, but that um, yeah, that's a lot of whiskey uh, to get through in, in one night. So we're going to do one whiskey per distiller, and we'll, we'll walk you through basically all the process, but that's how it's going to work tonight. Um, each of the distillers will present one of their whiskies, and, and the theme of tonight is um, looking forward. So... Aussie whiskey's been around for a while, and I'll let David talk about that shortly. But um, yeah, there's so much going on, especially in the last 12, 24 months, and then what's coming in you know the next couple of years. Uh, it's amazing to see. So if you're at home, uh, feel free to use the live chat um, and and you know shout out, um, ask any questions throughout. We'll we'll try and get to the questions um, uh, to any of the distillers. Call out um, you know at Bakery Hill if you want to ask a question directly like that. Otherwise, yeah, we'll, we'll just um, get to the questions when when possible. And, and David, um, celebrating 10 years of whiskey shows this year. Congratulations, mate. It's, it's, uh, where did it all start and, and how's Aussie whiskey been in that time for you? Thanks, Ollie, and uh, hi, everybody, uh, Tom and in the studio. Um, yes, this year is the 10th year of our, our whiskey shows, and last year was the first year that we, we had to go the virtual route. Um, and uh, the last year's uh, um, virtual Aussie show, this, the second one, um, <clears throat> was, was fantastic as well. <clears throat> and I remember looking back at our first whiskey show in Sydney in 2012, and the, the train spotters there might be able to correct me, but I can recall no more than, than a, a 10 or so um, Aussie distilleries that were around. So we had Lark, Overeem, Bakery Hill, Sullivan's Cove, Lime Burners, Hillier's Road, um, uh, Southern Cross was there. Um, if I remember, um, Tim Boone, Starwood, um, any others that I've missed? But uh, uh, those were the only ones that were there. We had uh, Casey Overeem pouring his whiskies. He won the inaugural um, Australasian Whiskey Show in 2012. We had uh, Patrick Maguire pouring the Sullivan's Cove French Oak, which was uh, around about uh, just over 100 bucks at, uh, at uh, all the major liquor stores then. Um, so those were the, the glory days and the early days of... Uh, of Aussie whiskey, and that was only 10 years ago. Now we're probably, well, last count, uh, I think we were looking at uh, 90 odd uh, active distilleries uh, with, with whiskey to market. Um, so it's come a long way in a very short period of time. So it's fantastic to see all the new brands out there and uh, looking forward to trying some of the interesting stuff that uh, is almost a preview of what's coming up in the next few months and, and year. Uh, it's amazing to hear, David, and, and, and great to see how much the industry has changed. Even in the last couple of years, we, we had, what, 60 distilleries like last year, and now we're, we're close to 90 uh, by the end of the year. So, yeah, it's a, it's a growing industry. Um, I forgot to actually mention there's going to be uh, two segments of this. So the first hour is going to be mainland Aussie whiskies. We just physically can't get all the distillers on at the same time. And at 8 o'clock, we will change over, and all the Tassie distillers will join on for the second hour at 8 o'clock. So... You know, pour yourself at your favorite glass of Aussie whiskey. Um, the first whiskey we're going to talk about um, from actually, welcome to all the, all the mainland distilleries. Uh, we've got um, David and Andrew from Bakery Hill, Jared from Headlands, Gareth and, and Ange from Flurio, Mike uh, from Morris, David from Five Nines, and Ian from Iniquity. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. It's great to be here. Awesome. So here. great, great to hear. Uh, Basically, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go through one whiskey per distillery. Uh, they'll, we'll hand it over to the distiller to walk us through the tasting notes. The very first one we're going to actually uh, talk about tonight, because Ian has double booked himself, uh, is the Iniquity Gold 
batch six. Uh, but I actually recommend, because it's such a heavy whiskey, uh, save it to the last whiskey around eight o'clock. Um, but uh, just because Ian has to get going, we'll get Ian to talk about it now, but we'll, we'll try the, the whiskey basically uh, a little bit later tonight because it's, it's around 60% actually. So, um, yeah, um, Ian, hand it over to you, mate. How's Tell us about the Thank gold number six. Thanks. My apologies, people, for having to disappear early, but uh, she who must be obeyed has organised my social calendar and not me, but that's the way it goes. Um, right. Our gold iniquity batch six is a pretty nice dram, just quietly. Uh, the provenance is that it was a barrel number 128, which was a Shiraz barrel, and for that it's quite weird because it actually smells and tastes more like a sherry barrel. Weird? I don't know. Overall first impression on the nose is sherry characteristics, as I was saying, with hints of cedar or fresh cut um, Douglas fir, which we know as, as Oregon. Uh, notes of Scottish Dundee bitter marmalade, which is kind of strange because I've only ever tasted it once and I still remember what it tastes like and this is what it reminds me of. It is 60.1% alcohol, but doesn't really taste like it. Um, so if you took a, wick of, a little sip of it now, you wouldn't actually think it was 60%. Um, trust me, it's there, but it just doesn't taste or smell like it. Um, on the nose, on the palate rather, you get a healthy alcoholic tingle. On the tongue, warmth without heat, as I was saying, uh, a creamy high octane mouthfeel, and those marmalade notes and a bit of polished wood come in at the end. Uh, the finish is autumnal leaves, sherry notes that are surprisingly gentle with a long, sour plum tail. Um, it's just a really, really well integrated, really nice whiskey. Can't recommend that enough. It's about two years since we last released a gold uh, batch whiskey, and that just shows you how rare they are, uh, which hopefully is an indication of how good they are. Uh, you've got another one of our whiskies in your kit, I believe, which is the Solera. Um, when you get around to that, entirely different, entirely different whiskey. Peach and Shiraz, which is not the sort of thing you usually come across. Um, quite unusual and quite pleasant tasting. I'll let you be the judge of that, though. Uh, what can I tell you about Tin Shinnit Distillery? We're moving at the end of the year. Uh, where, we're where moving up in the Adelaide Woods to a place called Woodside, out the back of the cheese factory and a chocolate factory, which is a nice place to be. <laughs> so we'll actually have a, a cellar door and I'll be getting fatter and fatter on the cheese and chocolates. But um, it's the price you've got to pay. Uh, congratulations on, on the incoming move, mate. That sounds exciting. How, how many um, whiskies barrels have you got laid down at the moment? Uh, we did a stock take the other day. We've only got about the equivalent of 45,000 bottles of, of whiskey and barrels. Uh, quite interestingly, we uh, we just put a new website together and we've changed the way we call operate our, our Den of Iniquity, which is what we used to call our members or subscribers clubs. And we will be introducing uh, a new range of whiskies this year called the Den's Drams and they'll be exclusive to members of our uh, Den of Iniquity. Uh, Unfortunately, one of the problems of dealing with things like the whiskey list and other whiskey clubs is the demanding exclusivity of some of our batches of whiskey. Uh, and you're an important source of getting to the market, an important route to market. So, in order to keep whiskey clubs happy, we've got to sort of depreciate one of the aspects of, that was a valuable thing of being a member of the Den of Iniquity, and that is that you're not going to get exclusive use of every whiskey, but you will get exclusive use of some whiskeys. No, it totally makes sense. And you've got to look after your own members as well. So Yeah. Great Trust to hear. Me, they'll be looked after. The Den's Drams, the first one's just waiting for the packaging, and it's beautiful. Uh, awesome. Congratulations on the new website as well. I was looking at it last night. It's um, it's a, a big improvement from your first one. So, um, yeah, great to, to see uh, the e-commerce functionality up there as well. So, um, yeah, nice work on that one. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Any uh, other hard questions before I disappear tomorrow? Uh, uh, I think one of the questions was, did you say 45,000 bottles or 4,000 to 5,000? No, we've got about 45,000 bottles <laughs> worth of product after Angel Share sitting in barrels. Well, so we, we typically expect to get about 250 to 300 bottles out of a 200-litre barrel. So I multiply, I'll divide that into 45,000. That's how many barrels we've got. Uh, amazing. It's can't wait. And, and when does Gold Batch uh, go on sale? Uh, I think you can buy it on the website now, actually. I think Ready it went go? Like yesterday or something. Oh, yeah. there you go. All the whiskies uh, that you're trying in your kits as well, um, everyone who's got a, a, a tasting kit would have received an SMS and an email from Chris earlier today 
uh, with a link to purchase. It will all go for sale for the TWL website and app at eight o'clock tonight as well. So we've got some small allocations of, of all the whiskies basically uh, available today, except some of the work in progresses, which haven't been released yet, but we've um, identified which one are they. But um, Tom Tom Yeager says, very tasty whiskey, well done. And, and Daryl and, uh, says, batch six is sensational. So Ian, that's um, you're getting some great feedback there. Well, that's good. I hope you can spoil it for everyone else and their whiskies. <laughs> well, I, I, I let people know, but um, Ian, if, I might let you get back to your party otherwise, but thank you for um, yeah, joining us tonight for the first few minutes. All right. I'm really sorry I can't stay and listen to the rest of you because I haven't seen many of you for quite a while, and it'll be good to catch up. No worries. We'll see you soon. See ya. see ya. See ya. Thanks, Ian. And just a reminder to everyone from home, uh, jump on, on the Whiskey List app, uh, our YouTube channel, all our Facebook socials, um, even the Whiskey Show. Uh, use the live chat, ask your questions, give us um, some feedback on what the whiskey is. Uh, and yeah, any questions for any of the distillers tonight, let us know what you think. But whiskey number two might head over to, to Jared from Headlands. Uh, mate, if you want to tell us about whiskey number two. Hey, everyone. I'm Jared, the distiller at Headlands Distilling Co. A uh, small distillery about an hour south of Sydney, um, right near the coast. Um, we started in 2015, initially started off with whiskey expecting that we were going to release it in two years. So the, the four to five year old whiskey releases were actually not planned at all. <laughs> so um, basically when we, when we were going to release it in two years, it didn't taste any good held it back to the next year and then we were really busy with gin and, and vodka and you don't kind of realize how long it takes to organize the graphic design, the the barcodes, all these other little things that add up in time. So we wanted to release the whiskey before Christmas so it ended up getting pushed back to the next year. So um, our first release was accidentally a four-year-old. Um, so the whiskey that I'm going to be talking about today is an exclusive for the whiskey list. It's a bourbon cask. And um, we've made this one in quite a different style than um, a lot of the other Australian whiskies that are available. So this one is much lighter in style, similar to a Japanese or an Irish whiskey. Um, instead of being like a, a really full bodied, multi sweet, long finish, it's more of an intricate spirit. Um, so if you do drink kind of like a, a musket cast before this, you're going to miss the, the really intricate flavors. So um, it's five years old in an ex-bourbon cask. Um, we think it's from Old Forester, but it's a brown foreman cask, so I'm not exactly sure. Um, distilled to a higher ABV, so it went into the barrel at quite a high ABV. Um, came out at 63%, and then we took it down to 58%. So the Whiskey List team came to our distillery, tasted a bunch of our barrels, picked the best one, and um, this is their favorite of our bourbon casks. Um, so this bourbon cask whiskey is actually what is basically the same whiskey as what goes into our finishing process for our musket and our para. Um, so back in the day, we were actually still fermenting with the grains in. So this whis whiskey is fermented um, in our mash tun with the grain still in an open top fermenter. Um, and then we, we took the whiskey out in the initial stripping run was not done in a pot still. It was pumped into the top column the top tray of a continuous column. So theoretically one distillation, um, but saving a lot of energy usage. So the initial distillation would come off at about 30 to 32%. And then it was the second distillation was carried out in a copper pot. Um, and yeah, then put in put into a bourbon cask and, and left to age. So um, much more subtle flavor, smooth on the finish, 58% light though. It's um, you get subtle notes of coconut, vanilla, honey, toffee, caramel, um, and it's got a hint of peat in this recipe. So just a tiny bit, not overly peaty. It's not a Lafroig or um, an Isla whiskey, but uh, yeah, there's definitely a hint of smoke in there. Um, so uh, Oliver mentioned you guys might be interested in kind of what's upcoming for us um, later on in the year. So growing around Wollongong is a a small native indigenous bush tucker plum called the Illawarra plum. And uh, it's a bit hard to get the angle of it. <laughs> so that these are frozen, so they don't normally look like they're covered in ice, obviously. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a small native plum about the size of a grape. Um, so we pick them and basically make Japanese umeshu out of it. We, we start wild fermentation, put it 
we actually put the plums into a barrel and then we put basically similar to our vodka into the barrel and leave that for two years. So this is the result. It's basically like an Illawarra plum liqueur style. We make two versions, one that's sweet, one that's completely dry. Um, and for Christmas, we're going to release a whiskey, a bourbon cask finished for one year in this Illawarra plum cask. Um, so, yeah, that's what's coming up for us later in the year. Jared, I remember I was uh, I was with the guys when uh, uh, we came down to have a look at those those casks, and uh, I think it took uh, um, all of uh, Ollie's willpower and a few of us holding him back to stop him taking the cask with him there and then. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I remember we're certainly him. the pick of the bunch, and uh, 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 interesting to see. And a few people have had uh, this before. Obviously, it's uh, it's sold really well through the whiskey list. Um, that uh, that that sounds like the perfect Christmas whiskey that uh, Illawarra Plum Plum finish. So it's uh, really looking forward to that one coming out. Fingers crossed, it it tastes good. <laughs> I've uh, been checking up on it a little. Good. I've been checking up on it here and there, but um, it's different. Now, the, the one interesting feature of your distillery is uh, the whole energy efficiency and conservation element. Um, I don't know if uh, too many people are familiar with uh, all the, the initiatives that you've put in place down there. Obviously, it costs a lot of money to do that, but uh, it seems to be worth it. Uh, yeah, so I don't want to rubbish my friends with the, the pot stills <laughs> because that makes the full, full flavor. Um, so... Basically, if you're running a, a distillation um, through a column, um, you get about an 80% energy saving. Um, so we actually run our wash through the condenser and we use the wash as the, um, as the cooling water. And then it's injected into the top column. This is only during the stripping run. We still finish the, the second step in a, in a copper pot. Um, but basically we get heating from 20 to 65 degrees for free. Um, so that massively cuts down our energy bill. Um, it, it, back in the day, there was, there's no longer any shortage of water um, at the moment, but um, you know, there has been droughts in the past. And um, by using the wash as the cooling liquid, we don't really have to use much water, just a, a tiny drip of water on a final condenser um, to just as more of a safety thing, um, to take the temperature down to the point where the stripping run is not producing a lot of flammable vapor. Um, a, a few other things like that. So we also can um, heat exchange the bottom liquid coming off the, off the column um, and get more heat back from that as well. So uh, yeah, a lot of different energy savings. You can do it um, part of the way with a pot still. You could say preheat your mash water with your condenser um, it would just be a little bit harder to preheat the, use the liquid that's left over in the pot um, to pass through a heat exchanger um, to preheat water as well. It's just a bit more um, work, a bit more manual labor to get all the, the energy back. Excellent. And uh, just a question from Chantal in terms of food matching with the uh, Illawarra plum finish. Um, have you, you've been, obviously you haven't had the whiskey yet, but uh, with the Illawarra plum uh, liqueurs and your gins, what goes best for those? Uh, so we love to um, we love to eat the Illawarra plum liqueur on vanilla ice cream. That's um, that's really nice. Um, people have been using it to baking cakes. Uh, they've used it as as meat basting. So um, it's it's really quite versatile. I like to put it in a in a French martini with some um, with with some pineapple juice because it's really heavy. It sinks to the bottom, um, but um. I'm not the most creative chef, sorry. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks, Jared. Awesome. I'm just sipping on your your bourbon cask now. I know we've we've um, sold we've sold quite a few. There's a few number of bottles left. Obviously, we've uh, kept back for the show tonight. But the vanilla notes from that um, old Forester cask just just sings. Um, and, and the balance of the spirit to me is just yeah one of the things I'm most excited about this cask. You know, me, I fell in love with it on, on day one and. And you were like, oh, have a look at this other cast. I'm like, no, this is the one. <laughs> For sure. So, yeah, quite a different whiskey fermenting with the grains in. You get a lot more tannin content, but that sort of cancelled out with the fact that it was distilled to a little bit of a higher ABV. So, um, yeah, a bit of a balancing act there. 
And and you guys are expanding as well. I saw on Instagram you guys uh, signed a new lease or something. What what's happening there? <laughs> yeah, so that that's a bit of a, a long story. But we bought another warehouse to store all in the same complex to store all our bottles and boxes and stuff before we had the loan approved. So um, it's almost approved. So it's been a stressful few weeks. <laughs> um, basically, we we signed the contract. Um, thinking I thought there was going to be plenty of it was a no brainer that we were going to get the loan. And then when it went to the bank, apparently I'd spent too much money on a lot of new equipment and we had basically no earnings. <laughs> so we've been shopping around and um, yeah, uh, we have 14 industrial units in our complex and we, um, we got a loan for another one to have more whiskey barrels, store bottles and boxes and a lot of the other things that were really clogging up our distillery area. So, um, it allow us to have a dedicated bowling area and that kind of thing. Uh, it's exciting to, to see um, all distilleries growing and expanding. So congratulations to, to the hard work you guys. Five years uh, under the radar. No one really knew there was a Wollongong distillery, uh, you know, just south of Sydney. But it's uh, you guys are out and out and proud and, and, and making some really amazing whiskey, the, the power of the musket and the bourbon as well. So looking forward to what's next. But yeah, thanks, Jared. Thanks, guys. Awesome. We might jump on to whiskey uh, number three, the Flurio from uh, Gareth and, and Ange. Uh, welcome. Hello. How are we? Um, whiskey to guard. Okay. So uh, within the pack, you should have two whiskies from us, of course. Uh, first one, the Jabberwocky, which has been released now for several weeks. We won't go into that at the moment, but uh, that's a crazy beast of a whiskey in itself. Uh, this is whiskey to guard, 60.3%. Why cast strength? Basically, because that's what the customers ask for. Uh, Chris Ross uh, was up on social media a few weeks ago with a very interesting uh, thread in, in terms of uh, distilleries releasing cast strength whiskies. Uh, from our perspective, it's very simple. Uh, when you visit us, uh, we're down on the wharf, we're in a tourism precinct, we've got a paddle steamer, we've got a couple of steam trains, we have a railway line that runs right through the distillery. And um, we get approximately down to the Wharf Precinct around about, according to the Gov Council figures, about 87,000 people visit us a year. And when whiskey aficionados visit us, uh, you don't want to turn up to a distillery and only have maybe you at Celador one or two whiskies. We are required to have five or six available up on the board for people to try. And they so, like that variety, and, don't the, they? and that's what yeah. customers want, you know, it is what the customer wants. And so they turn up, and so we can give them, uh, you know, a petered, uh, a collaboration, um, then maybe a tawny cask, a pure cask, um, possibly a bourbon cask in the future, and of course, a cask strength, because that's what the customer wants. It's, it's as simple as that. You know, people come to a cellar door, it's like, what? I can't even taste something straight out of the barrel? And so it's, it's almost obligatory uh, if you run a cellar door, uh, as we do for Florio Distillery, to have something like that. Um, but at the same time, whilst you're keeping, you know, providing something for customers that sell a door, you also want to be able to progress th further yourself in, in your distilling and your bits and pieces. Whiskey de Gard. Why de Gard? De Gard is French. Uh, we're for Florio Distillery. This part of the coast was uh, mapped, discovered by the French, by Bowden. Um, so we have a lot of French names uh, on our section of the coast of South Australia. And um, de garde, French, is basically to keep. Um, uh, classic style in France, beer de garde, which is beer to keep. It's not beer you drink straight away. Beer is normally best drunk fresh. Um, but there are some beers that do improve over time being vintage. Um, and so what, what we really have here is for us a little bit of a uh, experiment, for want of a better word. In terms of, we have enough um, museum stock now yeah. going back over time that when we look at whiskies from four or five years ago. They have actually softened or changed within the bottle over time. Um, and when we look back at our, our notes on when we first put the whiskey together and um, even putting things into um, competitions and getting feedback from judges, when you taste that whiskey again, after a period of time has passed, it's again different, mm. which is an interesting thing. That's something we didn't ex actually expect. So what you find is that, um, you know, if you put a cork on a, a bottle of beer, if you're bottling beer, the clock starts, it's got a shelf life. With whiskey, the idea is you put a cap in, cork on, the clock actually stops. 
But what we're actually finding is that with first fill Australian fortified casks, there's still change in the bottle. They still change over time. They still soften up. They're a little bit like an Australian, like a Barossan red. They're not going to go as amazingly soft as red wine, you know, at lower alcohol. But we do tend to find that Australian whiskies, if you leave them for longer in a bottle, they do soften up. So we came up with Whiskey to Guard. The whole idea is don't drink it. <laughs> this has a best, <laughs> best, best after date rather than a best before so date. Best after 2026. So the idea is, 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 is more of a European perspective. You know, Australians go to a cellar door in, in Australia and, you know, oh, I'll buy this bottle of wine, you know, it'll be better in five, six years' time, sell it, mature it. And the person at the cellar door knows that 98% of what's sold is consumed within 48 hours. Uh, Europeans are, have a different aspect of this. And it was great talking to Jose uh, many years ago at um, Casa de Venos one night, one very late night, um, and um, talking about that different European perspective of you buying stuff during the good times to put down to have during the hard times. And so this is, is for us, is a little bit of, a, of an experiment, for want of a better word in that respect, saying you buy it, but you don't drink it, you put it away. You don't collect it, you actually put it away for a special occasion sometime in years to come. Uh, car strength, 63.3%. The other part of the uh, experiment for us was this is our first release that we've ever blended um, uh, PX cask, so Spanish PX sherry cask, with Australian Oloroso or Australian sherry cask. So this is uh, wood from both sides of the world, effectively. So we've got Pira cask blended with PX cask, okay? Um, and we've never done a PX cask release. The closest we've ever done is a Fronty cask, uh, which was um, Englishman in New York, which is the tr Sting Trilogy, the last of the Sting Trilogy whiskies we ever released. Um, and so we've had a bit of fun here too. Pretty much um, everything we do is um, blends. We're, we're not big on small releases of single barrels. We are blenders. That's, that's what we do. We tend to go for big numbers, you know. Um, and we are now reaching, looking forwards into the future, we're reaching a situation where our blends, you know, 1,000 bottle runs rather than 300 bottle runs. It's, it's just something that we, or 600 bottle runs, which is going to be known for. And the reason for that is that we do notice as distillers that your, um, the output of your whiskey can go up and down with single barrels. And what we prefer to do is to try and blend so that you're getting the best of more barrels together. And then that way, people aren't disappointed by releases that they get where the quality might be swinging up and down. Um, it's more stable. Um, and then they know when they do buy a Flurio that um, it is going to have a family resemblance. Mm -hmm. We're very big with our whiskies on having our Flurio DNA in there. We, we blend in such a way to make sure that people go, it does matter whether you're having a Torty cask, a Pira cask, a Fronty, whatever it happens to be, even a Beetered, it's got the Flurio DNA in there. You know you're drinking the Flurio, okay? It's got that salted caramel pastrami umami character that we're known for, and whether you love it or not, that's the way it is. That's what it is. Although that might be different with our up and coming. With, with bourbon cast and yeah. other things that we've got coming through, yeah. they, they tend to uh, behave a little differently. So hopefully enjoy. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Australian sherry cask and uh, PX, a Spanish sherry cask, uh, blended, fatted, married together at cast strength. Um, it's a great little sherry bomb. That's the best way to, support, to describe it. If you've got a, a great whiskey collection, um, pour yourself three glasses. One of the uh, Fleuro Whiskey de Garde, one of, uh, of, of, of an Ambuna, and uh, grab yourself maybe, uh, I don't know, Glen Livet Najura, you know, grab yourself three sherry bombs and have a bit of fun, because that's what it's all about. That's a, that's a fascinating, fascinating approach, Gareth. Gareth. The, uh, the, one uh, question one is, uh, who comes up, whose job is it to come up with the names of your whiskies? Because uh, the most exciting part of a new release from Flurio uh, is looking at what the name is. And do you have a catalogue? Do you have a dartboard? We, we actually do collect names. We do collect names. So there are names we've got written down that we haven't used yet. And really, it, it has to be something significant. And some of these names that we've kept aside 
are ones that resonate with us, but the, the right whisky hasn't fitted it yet. Yes. So it's, for us, it's not so much about the destination, it's the journey, you know? Um, and part of that journey, part of these names is about where we are in that journey of where we're going. Or um, how the barrels yeah. speak to us. Yeah. So it's a reflection of the stories yeah. either within the distillery yeah. or that are happening around it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not the destination. In fact, I mean, it's not the destination, it's not the journey. It's the people you meet along the way. <laughs> but at the same time, yeah. that's what makes the journey, okay? And so we have these different names, these different things that we, we've about the place that is just us and it's fun yeah. it's fun yeah. fantastic and good luck with uh, encouraging people to keep those bottles for a few years without touching them <laughs> knowing what no this problem. crowd is like it's uh, it's going to be a challenge <laughs> they're going to need two <laughs> i mean it's great to drink now it, it has our classic fluoro characteristics drink it now that's fine but, but you take know, notes we, take notes and maybe if you can hold on to it till 2026. You know, we'd love to have a big party in 2026 where everyone cracks a bottle and we all get together online or something and and, and, and have a ball. No, that'd be brilliant. You know, that, that's so much fun to do. One of the, the Facebook comments here, sorry that the name is internal, so we don't know who it is. They say you can really tell it's a Florio production. So, you know, your signature is definitely through there. What caught me off guard until you started talking about it that it was a blend is the, the nose is all PX, but the finish is that spicy sherry. And I, my mind was thinking, like, what, what's going on here? And then, yeah, now you've explained it's a blend that that makes perfect sense. But it's it's such a good blend. I'm I'm very impressed with it. Well done. Thank oh, lovely. You. We reserve the right to throw a curve ball every now and then. <laughs> Uh, we've That's got a good. couple of other comments coming through. Paul said, uh, agree, but I did add a touch of water to see what it did, and the sherry influence really comes through stronger when you do. So if you're at home and you want to add a, a couple drops, I don't know, uh, Ange and, and, and yourself, uh, if you, you guys have done it as well? Oh, absolutely. You know, we we take we, we turn these things so inside out. We, we tear them apart, put them back together. We reassemble. We do a lot of work. Um, you know, blends don't just, just happen. They take a lot of work to go through. Um, you tear them apart, put them back together again, you mix them with water, you do all sorts of things. And that's the beauty with car strength. You can play with it. By all means, get in there and mess about with it. See what you can learn. See what you can find. That's the fun of it. Yeah, awesome to see. Uh, we had a question from YouTube. What would you compare to, say, Springbank 18 or an uh, Isle of Aran 21? Have you guys tried that uh, one? or? Uh, Springbank, yeah. Uh, Aran, no. Look, here's the thing. You know, as a whiskey distiller, you can't drink too much whiskey. You know, as a blender, I mean, my, a lot of my work these days is working and roughing up blends and then we get together and we polish them. Um, and you've got to be careful in many respects that you don't go off on tangents and start smashing down all of these different whiskies. So in, in terms of the Iran, I haven't tried that one at all. I have not tried it at all. Um, and, and Sorry, no. I'm, I'm going to talk right <laughs> over the top of you as I always do. We are an Australian whisky. We're not trying to be Scottish whisky. We're not trying to be a spring bank. We're not trying to be anything else. You know, it tells us what it does. We live in our own little cocoon down here on the south coast, you know, an hour and a half, two hours south of Adelaide. We are doing what we do and we love what we do. And we're, we're not trying to be anything but an Australian whisky. So, yeah, I can't really answer that. No, it's good, good to hear. There's... For, for everyone watching at home, there's so many stories going around at bottle shops, at bartenders. They've been asked for Australian scotch, which not, doesn't technically exist. We, we make Australian whiskey here. Scotch is scotch in Scotland. So Australian whiskey, mate, That's it's, it's a beautiful dram. Thank you for that. No, no it's all good. So it's, it's been, been busy times for us. Um, we've got four stills now installed. We've got a 154 kilowatt cooling tower. We're waiting on arrival um, to keep everything up and running. Um, in the future, we, we are known for our coastal style whiskies. We've managed, we can't mention too much about it at the moment, um, but we're looking at being able to store more barrels uh, up in the hills elsewhere so we can have a Flurio Highland and a Flurio Coastal whisky uh, in the future. So there's lots of things going on, you know, every day in you get up in the background <laughs> and on top of everything else, and every day you get up and it's a brand new day. You go to work with a plan in your head and within five minutes you can go out the door because there's so much that's going on. It's, it's uh, yeah, never a dull moment. 
No, it doesn't sound like it, but it's uh, great to hear from you both. And, and thank you for, you know, walking us through one of your brand new expressions. And we look forward to what's coming up next. Just in the interest of time, I might um, hand over to the next whiskey. Mike uh, is here on behalf of a distiller, uh, Darren, who's on his honeymoon from a Morris distillery, <laughs> Australia's newest whiskey distillery. So, Mike, welcome, mate. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, you look, and that's a pretty tough act to follow, actually. So, um yeah, I'm feeling a bit out of my depth. Darren, who is our head distiller, he's, um, as uh, as mentioned, he's actually away on his honeymoon today. So he obviously couldn't get get here tonight, but he sends his apologies. So you're left with me. So I'm sort of Darren's right-hand man. We're an original odd couple. He's uh, uh, the distiller from Northern England, and I'm just a local Aussie kid. So, um, but look, let's just jump into Morris. So a little bit about us. We... We've been around not very long, obviously, but we have um, 1859 was um, the beginnings for Morris uh, Fortified Wines. So the Morris family established uh, their winery in Rutherglen, Victoria, way back then, uh, around the Gold Rush time, um, established by a gentleman called Gregory, uh, sorry, um, George Morris. And um, basically, look, that, that business has been um, yeah running ever since then, over 160 years we um it's all family so there's six generations of family so there's still two generations working with us david boris is the head um head blender of the winery there and matt is his son so yeah look, so basically when we acquired the distillery from it was uh sorry the the winery was was actually uh owned by pono for some time and when we purchased that in 2016 um, it was almost just a, a lucky or happy accident that when we went into the wine into the, the winery and we found this old still that was um, originally used to make spirit for the fortified wine. So it was made in Adelaide in 18 or oh, sorry, 1930 and installed in the in the winery in the 40s. And um, we looked at that. We looked at all these amazing casts of musket, topaque, sherry, um, you know, tawny around, and we just looked at it and. There's a few of us in the business who are really just avid uh, whiskey lovers. And we looked at this and we thought, you know, we have to make whiskey. Um, so that was in 2016. So um, we reconditioned that original still. It's still, and then we put it back in the same place that it was originally uh, installed in the 40s. And um, so we started making whiskey back into 2016 and um, really just started pulling out a cast um, just, just this year. So a uh, little over three years old whiskey and you probably have the the two whiskeys that we have there's a sorry that's a signature i pretty much drank all that one and and we have the musket so the musket barrel so a um, little bit about both these whiskeys the signature we obviously we've made this to be a bit more approachable um it's a 40 percent abv and finished in um a, a couple of different fortified casts that we have at the winery there we all the barley is locally sourced we have access to um all red wine barrels through our family owned wineries in the barossa so shiraz barrels and cabernet bar barrels in kunawara um, we have access to our own family brewery as well craft brewery and um, so that's where our mash bill is made we use uh, a, a beer mash um, made from 100 uh, malted barley australian malted barley uh, and we also have our own Cooper as well. So he comes in and, and helps us recondition all of those um, red wine barrels, obviously uh, shaves them all back and rechars them um, to a, um, a regime that he won't really tell me about. But that really just provides this perfect vessel to create this whiskey. And, and so they're all aged in Rutherglen uh, at the distillery. And um, yeah, so basically we have the signature, which is the more entry level. 40 percent um obviously we've really tried to make that an approachable whiskey and, and it's it's sitting just under 100 dollars retail so we just really wanted to you know really give maybe some of those imported whiskies a bit of a run for their money in terms of um you know uh, showing that australian whiskies can compete um not just on, on on quality of liquid but also in accessibility as well so we really tried to to push ourselves to get that sub 100 and then we have the musket which is around 46 percent ABV. This is this bad boy here. So, what we've done with this, it's a similar base whiskey that we've used um, for this whiskey as the signature, but obviously higher ABV. But we've actually finished these in original uh, Morris fortified cast or musket cast. So, where the Morris signature is aged or finished in a variety of younger fortified casts, and when I say young, that's only six to eight years. 
but the the musket um, barrels are basically 20 plus years old. They're, we use them for our old premium brand musket, um, and um, that's the musket. It's obviously it's won a lot of awards, and Morris won. Um, I think it was a global fortified producer in, in number one in the world in the IWSC last year. So um, yes, yeah, so obviously the, these musket casts are pretty rare and. Um, what we've just make sure we've got to try and do is just really balance the inventory of, of those, those cars so we don't run out. Um, so, yeah, just tasting this one. I've got the, the notes here, but I kind of uh, usually just run off my own script. Um, so, yeah, like for, for me, it's a lot more aroma than our signature. Um, look, it's obviously in colour, it's a lot more brassy gold than our signature as well. You can see that. Um, the rum is, um, yeah, a lot more deeper. I get a lot of um, red berries or candy, candy fruit, um, molasses sort of, sort of on the nose, uh, and then the then the, the palate. So I really get this um, what I call Christmas cake. It's if anyone's drank musket, and if you ever get a chance, buy some buy some um, musket. Old premium rare is a more expensive one, but even the classic is the original one. And, I never used to, I didn't, I didn't even know what musket was actually probably 10 years ago, but it's, it's, it is like drinking Christmas cake. It's so delicious. You probably can't have too much of it, but it really brings all that flavor. There you go. You've got it there. Um, yeah. So I, I, I call it sweet spice. I call it, um, you know, I, I, the dark fruits that's yeah, coming through candied fruits that really comes through for me. Taste a bit of vanilla on the back palate there. Um, and then, yeah, for me, it's a, a longer finish than the signature. Obviously, it's just obviously got a lot more complexity than the signature, and um, probably it's it's not as easy. The signature for me is quite easy drinking. That's probably why I've got none left in my bottle. But uh, the musket is something that you can have a few of as well. It's um, a lot of flavour. Um, and look, yeah, this is our first um, uh, sort of addition over and above signature. But we're looking to extend the range with a, with a few other ideas obviously we want to try and keep everything that we do in-house so we're looking at we're always looking at our fortified barrels we want to make sure that we're not running off and doing crazy stuff we, we really want to just do what we're good at so we're working with david morris who's a head wine maker he's got you know obviously topaque barrels he's got a lot of other stuff he does locally there's you know, drift barrels for the, the, the wine um so we really want to experiment we've really fortified and really remain true to the to what the brand's all about and the heritage of the brand um and and then yeah so obviously the signature is the, our kind of our, our pillar and then we're just going to be releasing hopefully in the future a couple of different cast finishes or fortified cast finishes and there's a couple of barrels in the in the winery that i haven't been allowed to touch yet these are the ones that are over 100 years old um they've, they've had some really like highly award-winning fortifieds I'm doing my best to see if I can uh, beg, buy, and steal and get one or two of those. Um, so that will be obviously that will be in the future and maybe a bit of a step up in terms of price for that one, of course. But uh, yeah, that's that's kind of us. Um, can't think of anything else. I don't know. Like, well, thanks, Mike. Uh, it must be. Yeah. It must have, be a real privilege uh, having access to all of those old uh, uh, fortified wine casks. I think uh, a lot of distilleries are going to be quite jealous uh, that they can't get their hands on them. <laughs> you probably yeah. have uh, phone calls, emails, bribes uh, coming through. Um, we do. When, the, uh, when we got the, line, putting the hands up already. Um, but the uh, for such a short time in the market, uh, the uh, uh, Certainly, and you know, we're talking about the musket in particular now. It's certainly uh, got a lot of traction, a lot of uh, uh, firm followers, uh, and I'm uh, sure that everybody's going to be watching carefully to see what uh, you guys come up with next. No, thank you. And look, we just sort of we just wanted to get out there and um, see how it goes. Really, we didn't have any ambitions around how much we wanted to sell. We just wanted to make really good whiskey and and um, you know obviously make it accessible as well. Um, but all, you know, obviously do it right. And, um, you know, obviously with the still, the barrels and, and how we age it and, and how we finish it, we just want to make sure that um, we do it right and, and, you know, obviously produce something everyone uh, can enjoy. So, yeah, no, thank you. It's, um, it's just a privilege to be amongst everyone here and, and talking about it, what we're doing and listening about what, what everyone else is doing as well. So thank you. Quick question for you, Mike. So how... With, with obviously your musket cask and, and the bottle, I just held up people asking about it at home. This is the musket yeah. uh, itself. 
um, which, which is why it's so dark. It's a fortified wine. You empty yeah. your barrel, then you put in the whiskey. How long do you keep the whiskey in them in, you know, for maturing? Yeah, it, when we actually start, we, we actually wasted a lot of whiskey doing playing with all this because, um, as you know, um, you know, you can actually, if you age something in a, in a, in a true fortified cask, if you age a whiskey in there, it actually overpowers the whiskey and it doesn't even taste like whiskey when you pull it out. So we played with different durations. At the moment, the minimum is three months. Um, we've obviously done trials longer um, and... If for me, it's just finding the balance with the, with the whiskey because otherwise you, you, you're kind of bringing too much of that wine flavour and, and profile into the whiskey and it kind of doesn't feel like a whiskey. So it's, um yeah, we, we've obviously, three months is, is kind of the sweet spot for us. But then the older the muskets as well, um, and the, the more flavour in parts. So, um, you know, that you've, we've got to think about, you know, what barrels and there's some barrels down there that, you know, as I said, over 100 years old. So you've got to be really careful about, you know, how you balance the whiskey with that, with that fortified flavour. No, that makes sense. And, uh, yeah, congratulations again on, on launching uh, with two two new Aussie whiskies entering the market. That's it's amazing, guys, and looking forward to, to seeing what else is next. Uh, those Tokay casks, uh, I think uh, Jason just commented on Facebook. Uh, he's looking forward to that. Uh, I'm going to highlight a quick comment from uh, Peter Bignall uh, from – Belgrove and Remnant, he'll be joining us in the next uh, at 8 o'clock. But, uh, yeah, high praise from him. Uh, he's, he's keen to try some, so you might need to uh, send him down a bottle. <laughs> yeah, can do that, no problem at all. <laughs> awesome. Uh, just conscious of time, might move over yep. to where up to Bakery Hill. Um, you guys have been making whiskey 20-plus years, but today something different, a sherry finish. Uh, we have indeed. Um, there it is. There's the sherry finish. Hang on, look at it in front of you. And can I show you the label? There it is. Now, you people are very, very, very special. You are the first people in the universe to try this. This has never been released before. Uh, we thought this was a perfect example to do it. Now, before we get on to the sherry and why we've done that, behind me, the still, that's been sitting there now for 21 years. 21 years? It's a bloody long time. Now, just a little history uh, with our distillery, and you'll see why the sherry fits in as it is at the moment. 21 years ago, I was interested in whiskey. I read magazines and articles, and most books, magazines and articles from Scotland said the only place in the world that can make whiskey is Scotland because of the air and the water. If you ain't got the air and you ain't got the water, you can't do it. That stopped everyone. Now, my background was organic chemistry, so no breaking bad comments. I've heard them all. So I decided to use my uh, skills to make whiskey because whiskey is a process. If you understand it and you can modify it for local conditions, it must be possible. So when I started, I was the first distillery here on the mainland of Australia. There were three, maybe four small distilleries in Tasmania. They'd probably been going about five years. So I decided that the time had come for the world to get Australian whiskies with the Tasmanians. Now, I, my focus basically was on American oak bourbon cask maturation. We did a classic, which is unpeated. We did a peated and we did a double wood. Now, most of the time, we well, all the time until recently, we've used American oak bourbon casks, basically because I wanted people to enjoy the whiskey and not have sherry, port, Madeira, musket sort of alongside. Now, this is why the sherry for us is very, very, very different, and I'm interested in comments when we get to it. So basically, we did for about 15 years American oak bourbon cask maturation. And uh, the other thing that we do, it's single cask because no two trees in the world are alike. No two barrels will mature at the same rate or at the same depth. So we mature our, we, we single cask and we mature for six, seven, eight, nine or 10 years, depending on the structure of the cask. Uh, we don't know how long it's going to take. Now, as the other distillers tonight will know that because our climatic conditions are different to Scotland, 
our whiskies are maturing at twice the rate. So a five-year Australian or Australian whiskey is equivalent to a 10-year scotch because of our uh, higher temperatures, fluctuations, and so on. So that's basically where I've come from. We use pot stills for our distillations. Um, tonight, we've got the, the sherry cask. Now, what I'd like to do is throw across to Andrew, he, my son, uh, perhaps he could talk to us about the sherry, how we do it, and uh, a bit of the history behind that. Yeah, good guys, great to be here. Um, hope you're on your, your whiskies. Fair few and uh, probably we're using American Oaks bourbon barrels for uh, maturation. Um, a bit of fun. If Hello, we're dropping out. A bit of some, some experimentation. So uh, what we actually worked through here was um, uh, we traded uh, Chief Sun Distillery Oil and a couple of their sherry barrels for a couple of our bourbon barrels. Um, so the, these barrels have come from... Um, in Barossa Valley. Um, what we've done is we've matured our classic untipped whiskey in our American oak barrel for three years. We've then transferred it to that sherry or barrel. Um, and um, finally, we, did, we put it in that sherry barrel for about 18 months um, before bringing it back a bourbon barrel softened for about another 12 months. Um, so it's a bit of a sherry barrel switch, really. Um, and, um, yeah, so I hope, hope you guys enjoy it. I think my internet's pretty bad here up down the coast. So um, shoot through your, your comments. Um, maybe, you know, Dad might be able to finish off uh, talking through some of the flavour profiles. I don't know if you guys can still hear me. I'm getting feedback on my phone that the internet's no good. But, yeah, um, it's a, it's a yeah, bit tough. So it's, I hope you guys are enjoying. No, thanks, thanks for that, Andrew. Send us through your comments on the, on the live chat. What people uh, what what people think at home? So we got on um, Baker Hill, really nice, really good, clean finish. Tom has said another great whiskey. Awesome hearing about the history and different approaches to making whiskey in general. Great, great feedback, mate, and very nice. Much more uh, subtle than a lot of the sherry bombs out there. So yeah, great to hear it. What's um what's the ABV on this one, uh, David? 40, uh, 48%. Uh, 48. Both uh, those, 48. We, we tried, <laughs> yeah, sorry. We tried different levels. What we do is we obviously we have our cast strength and then we try different levels to see uh, which is going to work best for that particular uh, whiskey. And we found for this we needed a little bit of extra spirit, the higher alcohol, just to give it a little bit of substance. So for that we, uh, we're working on 48 our normal distillery selections, we operate on 46%. This just needed that a little bit of extra. So it's 40, 48%. But we're also releasing it at cask strength as well for all the, the cask strength nuts. Excellent. So it's a, a new area for uh, for Bakery Hill, new premises, um, yes. new direction with some, uh, some sherry finishes. So it's uh, exciting um, times in the Bakery Hill. We're, we're about yes, and uh, we're about to release uh, another one, which is very very interesting. Um, it took us a little while to worry to think up a name for this one. Um, basically, you ask, I uh, use ask Harris. Yes, he'll, he'll give you names. I'll give you a name. Don't worry, we've got it. Don't worry, we've got it. Um, <laughs> we used uh, we used an external um, brewery for the first four years. Mountain Goat Brewery basically brewed for us for the first four years um, because at that time I wasn't going to rush out and spend a lot of money on distillation equipment, a lot of money on brewing equipment, and by golly, I can't make whiskey in Australia. What a waste of all that money. So I used Mountain Goat Brewery for the first four years to brew for us, then um, installed the brewery here. Now, So that was uh, 17 years ago. Now... What, I've, what we've done with the next release is I've kept two barrels, two uh, large barrels sitting out the back from that production. So we had penciled on it DBs first. It was the first batch that we totally made here under our total control. Brewed, 
the whole lot, milled, brewed, distilled, matured. So we had to come up with a name. What are we going to call it? What are we going to call it? Back in those days, you had to be a nut to be making whiskey because everyone said you can't do it. Thinking about that, so we thought about it. We've got two barrels. I know what we'll call it, death or glory. So it was either going to be death or glory for us. So that will be released shortly. Um, we're, we're still organising labelling and whatever, but that, that's a little something that uh, we'll, we'll release once we move into the new premises. So new yeah. premises. Uh, so David, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna yes. I'm gonna have to to cut you off, mate, because we're just short on time. But Death and okay. Glory sounds great. Paul Paul uh, from Facebook's given a great suggestion. How about Baker's Delight? <laughs> um, yes, <laughs> could be awesome. But uh, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, Andrew and David uh, from Bakery Hill. David Pierce from Five Nines Adelaide, jump on, mate. Yeah, so. Um, Thanks for uh, having me. Um, so for those of you who don't know much about Five Nines, so we're, we're based up in the Adelaide Hills. Um, we're a really small distillery, been operating since 2016. We sort of started our life making whiskey. Um, Steve, myself, um, we actually make most of our whiskey in, in, our, in my garage, actually. So we've got a thousand litre pot still that Steve and I built. Um, and yeah, we, we still both work full time and we spend our weekends making whiskey. So we've over the last since 2016, we've managed to accumulate quite a lot of whiskey. Um, we've got sort of about 40,000 litres sitting in bond now. We've pretty much grown outgrown my garage. Um, we're about to move to a to a temporary distilling. Um, the um, the temporary distillery will probably spend about two years in. Um, just to, to be able to increase our production. And then we're we're in the process of buying some land to um, really scale up our, our production and I guess build a cellar door and those sorts of things. So um, we're actually having to move out of the Adelaide Hills for about two years um, into down into Dudley Park um, in the city. Um, hopefully it doesn't influence too much the, uh, the flavour of, of our whiskey, but um, we just need to be able to ramp up our production. Um, we've got a lot of demand for our whiskey um, and um, want to be able to produce more than more than just weekends. And um, Steve and I would actually like to be able to give up our day jobs. We'd, we'd like to have our weekends back. But yeah, um, so tonight we've got uh, quite a quite an interesting whiskey, um, something that... Um, we were we were thinking about releasing, and then you know Chris and Ollie kept ringing me and saying, "When are you going to release this um, cola cask whiskey?" So, so this is just a bit of a bit of a playful, fun whiskey, bit of a I guess bring back some youthful memories of maybe drinking whiskey and cola. So so this was a, a French oak cask. Um, we put some uh, some a fairly popular brand of cola in it for for about three months. Um, you know, just had to empty a hundred odd bottles of uh, two liter bottles of cola into into this barrel, and then just let it sit there for about two months. To and it was just oozing cola out of every uh, every pore of this, this poor barrel, and and emptied it out and and, and filled it up with um, it, it was actually some whiskey that had come out of a, a couple of bourbon casks. Um, so yeah, it's it's been about eight months in this cask, and and it's just a um, yeah, just look, it's a it's a really interesting, fun whiskey. So lots of flavors of caramel, um, butter. Obviously, you, you you get you get a hint of cola, hints of chocolate, um, burnt caramel, um, vanilla, um, and yeah, just a just a good fun whiskey. Sorry, I was looking for my button. Uh, great to hear. I'm actually <laughs> trying it for the first time now. It's um. The, the sugars from the cola comes through, but it's it's. I was expecting much more like sweetness, but it, it the balance is there. It's quite unique. Yeah, it's it's surprising actually. I I was sort of I was a bit worried about this one that the the cola would actually overpower the whiskey, but you can actually still still taste the whiskey behind. I'm getting bits of like um, orange rind in, in there as well, which is unique. Um, I don't know if that's intentional or where that where that's coming from, but it's yeah, it's good. I know. I think it's just good luck, Ollie. No, it's good. We got a question from uh, YouTube from uh, Chantel. Uh, why, why are you called Five Nines? 
Uh, so it's actually got a bit to do with my my background. So I, I'm in IT, um, have been for the last 30 odd years and in five nines is something that is almost perfect. So I guess it's our goal in life, making whiskey, making spirits. We're searching for five nine, so something that is ninety nine point nine 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 percent perfect. We'll never we'll never achieve it, but it's but it's our goal in life. Yeah, awesome. No, I think uh, you're getting pretty close there already. So you know. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ollie. Um, I think we've got time for one more quick question. I know at eight o'clock I said we'd uh, switch over to the Tazzies, and they're all waiting to jump on. I can see them in in the waiting room there. So uh, Tom actually goes, "What's next, lemonade?" So there, there's one. <laughs> Oh, uh, look, there's, there's all sorts of different things. I mean, we'd, we'd actually like to try and do, we've got, we've got some stout barrels down at the moment. Um, we're collaborating with a, with a local brewery around stout barrels. I really like the, you know, the delicious chocolate flavours that, that that imparts on the whiskey. We're about to put down some um, ginger beer casks, uh, but uh, we, we want to use our own ginger beer. So we've got a very talented young um, distiller who works for us part-time, who actually also is a bit of a, a handy brewer. He likes to make ginger beer. So we're going to put down some ginger beer casks and then eventually they'll be filled with uh, whiskey as well. So look, just we, we like to have a bit of fun, you know, we, and uh, hopefully it'll make some really nice whiskey eventually. Yeah, I think you're, you're getting a few fans through Facebook saying stout barrels would be awesome. So, yeah, we, we, we definitely need to see more of that, mate. Thank you. So this cola cast has just gone up on our website um, about half an hour ago. So, well, there you go. Jump on it, guys. Five nines dot com dot au. Five nines distilling dot com dot au. Well, there you go. All right. Um, I think we are short. Uh, well, we're pretty much right on the hour. Really good timekeeping on this uh, on, on my behalf, and then David's here as well. Thank you to all our mainland distillers. So David and Andrew from uh, Bakery Hill, Mike from Morris, Jared from Headlands. <laughs> Thanks. Gareth and Andrew from Flurio and David Pierce from Five Nines. It's been a pleasure chatting to you the last hour, Aussie whiskey, and, and, and yeah, looking forward to seeing what's next. Good. Thanks, Thank guys. Thank appreciate Thanks, guys. your support of our shows. We'll see you next time. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Awesome. So we'll uh, we'll wait for them to quickly jump off whilst uh, the, the mainlanders are jumping off and we're getting the Tassie guys on. Uh, what are we going to do? I just want a very quick recap. Um, yeah, everyone's got their whiskey show, their little kits at home. Um, obviously, there's a little tasting notes instructions in there uh, for both sides. The, the one thing that we wanted to highlight is jump and download the app. Uh, just iOS and Android stores, search whiskey list, and, and basically uh, jump on download the app. Uh, at 8 o'clock, all the whiskies are now available to purchase as well. So you can uh, jump on the app um, or even go to our website. So there's a short URL there. It's whiskey.me.showshop. And everyone who's got tickets to the show um, have got a little um, present as well set uh, via SMS and uh, email to you as well. Uh, if you're just watching from home in general, then you can still go on and, and buy our whiskies as well. Don't forget to rate the whiskies as well. So download the app. Uh, if anyone who rates all 18 whiskies in your sample kits, and, and it's a try at your own pace, so you don't need to do it all tonight, but over the next two weeks, try all 18 whiskies, rate all 18 whiskies, uh, and you automatically go into the draw to win a bottle uh, from one of our, our Aussies uh, whiskies. We'll, we'll figure out which one it is. Uh, I think it might be the, the Headlands uh, bourbon cast, but I've got a few spare bottles behind me. We'll, we'll find some spare whiskey for you. And yeah, anyone who rates all 18 whiskies from home will automatically go into the running. Uh, we'll run this competition this way for the next two weeks. Uh, so that's all you got to do. Try, rate, and, and then, yeah, if you want to buy any whiskies, jump into the app or our website to, to buy any of the Aussies tonight. All right. I think we might invite our Aussie uh, distillers, uh, our Tassie guys on now. Let me just bring everyone in. Give it one second. Good evening, everyone. Okay. Hi, Tazzy. Evening, all. Hey, guys. Sam. You guys all in the same room, just with different backdrops. Yeah. Maybe. Pretty much. Wouldn't that be the first time. <laughs> That's right. Well, welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight uh, for the, the second half of the, the virtual Australian whiskey show. Uh, the, the second hour is going to be just focused around uh, Tazzy whiskey, basically. So. There's um, quite a few Tassies 
uh, distilleries out there. But these are, you know, you guys have, have all put together something quite special for the show. And we've got a couple of show exclusives to talk about tonight as well. But just as a quick round of introductions, we've got Peter Bignall uh, from Belgrove, but representing uh, Remnant tonight. And we'll explain what Remnant is uh, shortly. We've got Jane and Mark from Overing. We've got Cam from Spring Bay and John from Hobart with a beautiful, you know, stack of barrels behind him. Awesome. Well, let's jump straight in. Uh, which one are we going to go with? We're going to have Doing Fox the, Shots. Uh, well, we've got, we got to do over him because you know, it, is, it is 10 years since our first whiskey show and 10 years since Overeem took uh, top honours at the inaugural Australasian Whiskey Awards. It's a long time ago, Jane. Uh, I don't know if you remember that that day. Um, oh, I do. Casey was very excited. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I remember that. It still comes up on my Facebook memories too, every year. <laughs> <laughs> so now we've got uh, the, the Flock Shots uh, number two, uh, which was uh, released that not, not that long ago and uh, um, as popular as the first one. Um, and uh, uh, that's at 43%. Um, for those of, of in, who've got their kids who haven't had the flock shots before, uh, can you just give a brief overview of, uh, of what they are, what, how, how they come about, and um, uh, how this one differs to the first one if people have got both of them? Mm, absolutely. Sure. So, um, yeah, for those who don't know about um, flock shots and who don't exactly know what flock is, um, I'll try to explain it quite simply. Um, but basically, when we decant a cask of ovarine, um, it's, it normally decants at about 63, 63.4%. Um, and if we decide on the tasting panel that the whiskey should be brought down and bottled at 43%, we add beautiful Tassie water to that whiskey um, and bring it down to 43. Now, what happens when you bring it down to that level of ABV is a natural um, flock will form in the whiskey. Now, flock, um, it looks a little bit like sediment, but basically it's like these little fine particles that float around in the whiskey, and there's nothing wrong with them. They're absolutely beautiful, natural occurring fats and oils in your whiskey, um, but they do cause your whiskey yeah. to go cloudy. Yeah, I've actually got one too that I'll. I don't know if you'd be able to see it. You may or may not. Oh. I don't know. Can you see this? Mm, there's a bit of air. cloudy. Yeah, can't see through. It's a little bit of cloudiness yeah, probably, there. Probably a bit of glare there. Like that, yeah, it's a bit tricky. Anyway, yeah, you can, you can see it in yours a bit better, Oliver. Yeah, there. Yeah, sort of moves around. Looks a little bit like smoke <laughs> going through the. Um, yeah, there you go. That's a good one, Oliver. Yeah. And if you give it a good shake, it disappears, but it makes the clear whiskey become cloudy. Um, and if you don't know what flock is, you might wonder, you know, what is that weird stuff floating around in my whiskey? So there's two things you can do. You can either chill, chill filter it to get that flock out. Um, but when you chill filter, yeah. you actually um, are stripping away a lot of those fundamental fats and oils. Um, and what we do at Overeem is we actually undertake a settling process. So between six and eight weeks, it takes us to settle out that flock right to the bottom of a vessel. Um, and then we draw the clear whiskey from the top and the clear whiskey goes into bottle. And then what is remaining at the bottom of the vessel is um, beautiful Overeem single malt whiskey, but it's full of flock. Um, now, when Casey Overeem, my father who founded Overeem Distillery, um, was in charge, he used to take home that flock um, and put it in his decanters and share with all his friends and family members um, because he loved it so much. He thought it was really beautiful and rich and oily and the best part of the run. Um, so that's what he used to do, but now that dad's not in charge, we thought let's get this in bottle. Um, so we've got this in bottle now um, and it's exclusive with the whiskey list. Um, they released 100 bottles last year and this year now 200. Um, but basically what it is is our sherry cask and port cask block married together with some clear whiskey as well. Yeah, um, we didn't want to yeah, give you yeah. the full dark mud flock at the bottom of the vessels, but there's a lot of flock floating around in these in these whiskies. So. Yeah, so we're left with about five to 10 litres out of every single cast yeah. because we do exclusively single cast releases at Overeem. So we're left, we're left with about five or 10 litres that we marry together um, to create this product. Yeah. Um, and we hope you're all enjoying it. Uh, as far as tasting notes go, um, 
I suppose it's, I think one thing you'll notice, especially after tasting some of the maybe higher ABV releases um, uh, from the mainland is uh, um, it's, it's so oily and it's so fatty and oily and it's really viscous on the palate. Um, I mean, you'll get that that overeem signature, you know, especially with our port 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 cast matured whiskies. Uh, you know, you'll get that butterscotch and that honeycomb and that toffee, um, but it's it's got a really lovely Moorish mouthfeel. That a uh, lovely mouthfeel. It's very very Moorish. So uh, uh, we hope you're enjoying it. It this certainly is, has got that, that chewiness to it. And so this is a mix of, of different types of casks. Yeah, uh, it's, the, the, it's the remaining crop from port and sherry port casks and that we've yeah. decanted throughout the year. Any any plans or any thoughts of doing what I call, for what a better name, single origin flocks, flock shots? Release. Yeah, that'd be small. That'd be small bottlings, I suppose, because, like I say, they're only like five to ten liters that that, that remains at the bottom of the settling tank. So, um, it'd be small bottlings, but it's something we could look at potentially. Yeah, well, we'll just have to drink more over him so you get more flocks. Yeah, yeah. Mate, I think that's the uh, that's the message. <laughs> for for me, and, and and this has been repeated multiple times in all our Facebook groups. It's, it's like whiskey butter, and and this, yeah. this user said slides down slides down the throat beautifully. I, I you know completely agree. It's a such a unique whiskey, and it's a interesting that there's so much debate globally about chill filtering and all that. We won't go into it too much, but you you know you stand by a product uh, and, and it's delicious and it's great to actually get this in front of consumers, especially with um, COVID and lockdown. I, I know it's always been kind of a cellar door exclusive. So when we spoke to you guys first to see if we, can we get it out to the masses? Um, so yeah, it's uh, I think there's a few bottles uh, down in for Tassie whiskey week for you guys as well, right? Yeah. We've got a, yep. a handful left. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, Adam, Adam uh, jumps in whiskey butter as well. Well, thank you for yeah. that. We might jump into, uh, Actually, what what's um my my favorite overeem and, and and you probably already know which one's this uh, is coming out very very soon. When 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 are we getting the the bourbon cask? Yeah, so big one for us this year. It's the mm. first overeem twelve year old whiskey um to hit the market. So that will be around October November this year. Um yeah, yeah. Dad put those uh he put six two hundred liter bourbon casks down in two thousand and nine. So we're lucky enough to be able to release these this year. Any any sneak peeks in a couple of weeks, couple of months? <laughs> well, I'd say early November. It'll be it'll be here before Christmas. All right, that, that means uh, with uh, shipping and everything, we'll have it in in you know, Santa. We'll we'll definitely have it on Christmas Day, right? It's got to be out Absolutely. by Christmas. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Awesome. Well, well, thank you for, for taking us through the flock and we can't wait to, to see what's next. We might jump on to um, whiskey, the next Tassie, John Jarvis uh, Hobart. Walk us through um, this uh, this cast sample you've got for us. All right. How are you going? Um, so uh, the tawny, right. So um, for those at home that don't know who I am, I'm John Jarvis from Hobart Whiskey. Uh, what we've got on the tasting today is our uh, a tawny cask. Um, a lot of people probably, you know, sort of know we're pretty renowned for our bourbon cask maturation. This one's a little bit different for us. So this is actually a full maturation tawny, matured in a pair of 100 litre tawny casks for about three years. Uh, and then finished, we, Ben and myself, decided to pull these out and uh, pop them into uh, a, two, a fresh 225 litre tawny cask finished. So tawny matured, tawny finished. A uh, big, rich, very tawny-driven whiskey, which, you know, is a little bit different to what we'd normally do with our standard uh, bourbon maturation and cask finishing. Um, for those that try, you know, it's almost to the point of being that much tawny that, you know, I on the tasting panel, I wanted to back in a little bit of bourbon cask to it to help to sort of round it out a bit and uh, add a little bit of bourbon to it. I think that's just the prejudice that I have towards bourbon cask, though. Uh, but I was guided by quite a few people on the panel and, and Ben as well. And we we're like, no, we're just going to put it out as is. So, yeah, keen to see what people at home think and uh, everyone else who's there. And at uh, 51, 51%, John? 51.1%. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we've uh, since bottled this one. Uh, this one's available now. Uh, this is our fifth, yeah, fifth release for this year. Oh, 
Sorry, I was on mute. I was going to say this whiskey is perfect for dessert for me. Like after steak, a bit of mash for dinner, had a Shiraz, you know, to go with it. And then, you know, you want to finish with a, a decent whiskey. This this is the, the sweetness really kicks through and um, cleans the palate as well. It's refreshing. What's um what's coming up next for you, John? I, I know you're doing a lot of different stout cast finishes, a lot of different other beer finishes. What what's on the horizon? Yeah, all right. So we've just sort of yeah, we have finished uh, four beer casks uh, four beer casks recently. That was a, an absolutely monstrous undertaking, uh, but I think we pulled it off. Um, look, we've got a few things in the works. Uh, you know, it's um we've only just gotten this one out. Um, we've got our signature always, which we'll probably get onto next. I'm not sure if we're going to be covering that one on here tonight. Um, but yeah, we have a couple of unique cast pictures coming up, you know, hopefully this year. It just depends how they come along. I, I can't go into too much detail until I know, you know, we're a bit closer. No, that makes sense. And uh, when, when the whiskey's ready, it's ready. It'll tell you, right? That's right. Paul's, uh, I'm a sucker for a port finish and this is a cracker. So uh, high praise from, from our, some of our viewers from home, mate. Thank you. How's your um, port pipe coming along? I know I ask you this every single time I see you, but that, I'm, I'm very excited about that one. Uh, yeah, it probably still needs another 14 or 15 years, I imagine. So it'll it'll get there, but it's uh, tucked away down there under the sign. So when you come to this, you'll have for example, and, um, and you'll be able to try it for yourself. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question from YouTube here, Chantel. Unfortunately, all these are sold out in, in about a week. Uh, and, and a few weeks ago, um, it's all gone. But we, we do the virtual Aussie whiskey show once a year. So this is the second one we've done. And, and yeah, look out. Uh, we'll, around July, usually each year, we'll, uh, David, uh, hopefully this has been a great success and we'll repeat it next year. So, um, yeah, jump online, the whiskey show, uh, .net .au, and then, yeah, look out for next year. Well, thank you, John, for, for walking us through this uh, this wonderful cast sample. And it's available now, you said? It is, absolutely. Yes, awesome, I think great. It was a weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, it's tasty. And yeah, jump on your, your signature as well, which is, um, I think you're, you're on batch two now as well? Uh, signature, we're actually up to batch six. I can't remember exactly what we sent up to you, but um, I think I sent you batch four, but it's sort of going, going leaps and bounds. So. Yeah, of course, we're, we're renowned for our bourbon cask maturation. Um, yeah, and, you know, our signature is our, our core range item. So we wanted to put out a whiskey that was always available, very consistent, uh, you know, relatively consistent, I should say. Uh, I believe, do you have batch four, Ollie? Did you check? Is it batch it's, four? It's batch, batch? it's batch five. Batch five, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and look, it's just we uh, put out these limited releases like our tawny, you know, when they're ready. Uh, but the problem is, you know, bars, restaurants, bottle shops will order something, ring me up a couple of weeks later, a few weeks later, and be like, John, need more. And it was, we just would sell out and we wouldn't have it anymore. So, um, yeah, Hobart with your signature, standard, close within our range, always available. Um, yeah, look, uh, a typical, typical, I, I say typical, but, you know, it's all uh, open to interpretation, I guess. But it's got a lot of that, you know, the bourbon, vanilla, caramel, coffee notes coming through very sweet very approachable um and i'm very interested to see what people in the chat think if anyone's had a chance to try it yet yeah we're getting uh, some few comments coming through as well so um yeah irena just uh put a reminder in your phone 14 years later so uh you know you, you'll get a few few randoms knocking on the door in about 14 years and you won't remember why <laughs> <laughs> awesome david any other questions from your side no, no, it's uh, it's a fantastic stuff and uh, a really interesting release. And the, there's no doubt that tourney is going to be popular. It's uh, uh, really looking forward to seeing how, how it goes and how people <laughs> rate it in the app when they they put in their entries to to win the bottle. Awesome. Might a uh, segue across to the to the next whiskey, uh, Peter Bignall uh, from uh, representing Remnant tonight. Peter, welcome. Me too. Yes, yeah. Thanks very much. And um, yeah, good evening, viewers. So what, tell us, um, sorry, I put the wrong one up. Tell us, uh, firstly, what is Remnant? Because it's an it's a, it's a independent bottling, right, first of all, and so slightly uh, got a bit of a different uh, history to it. It's not just a normal Tassie distillery. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm um, basically a Belgrave distillery, but uh, you know, I make rye and, and oat whiskey mostly. But, but um, yeah, Remnant, really the, the whole story starts back in the 1800s. Um, it's what got me intrigued about it. Um, my grandparents and great-grandparents owned a, a property 
at near Bothwell in Tasmania called Nant. And um, my the, the, eventually um, it got sold on to um, another family. Then eventually um, a guy from Queensland bought it and wanted to start a whiskey distillery there. And I got the, got, got the job there in this old flour mill, um, water-driven flour mill, fixing up the old water mill, the wooden cogs and the, and the mill stones to grind the grist for the, for the distillery. And while, while it was being built, I just got very intrigued by whiskey distilling. And um, I was actually offered a job there as a distiller because I got an agricultural science degree, did a lot of food technology and microbiology, et cetera. But um, anyway, after a bit of thought about it, I said, no, don't want to do that. So I came back to my farm and started my own distillery a couple of years later, basically because I had a surplus of rye grain that couldn't sell it. So but anyway, back to the uh, remnant a bit. Anyway, you probably know that um, the story, I can't mention the name too much. Um, the, it, it, it turned into what I, I call a Ponzi scheme that um, yeah, a lot of barrels um, were sold to investors and apparently a lot of them were never ever filled. Um, but there were some barrels there that were filled. Um, the original owner went broke in a big, big way. The, um was sold out to another company who, um, who started buying some of the barrels back that were actually filled. Um, and then they decided that this original offer by, by the, the first owner, they were just not sustainable. And um, a lot of these barrels came on the market that were the barrels that actually had been filled. Um, they, they came on the market um, at a, a very, very reduced price. And so um, I got my, my eldest son involved and a couple of other investors and um, we, we bought a lot, of, a lot of the barrels from those investors. Uh, brought them down to Belgrove, put them in a bond store here, went through them all and valued them. And um, well, yeah, we, we paid out the paid out the investors. Unfortunately, we couldn't pay as much as they thought they were going to get. But no, some of them got a pretty good payout. But um, some of the whiskies was were pretty ordinary. Um, but what we found is that you know, some of those fairly ordinary barrels, yeah, you know, we can blend them together. And um, you know, that, they were just out of balance basically. The odd ones were too woody, they're too old, and they've never ever been bottled. But just every now and again, we found a barrel that's uh, that was really good. So um, I, I think we've got two barrels here, have we? That um, that, that you've got on the on the list there. Is that, is that right, uh, Ollie? Is that the two barrels we've got, or two two bottlings? We did. We've got two yeah. bottlings, but we're we're talking about the the lockdown tonight. The lockdown. Okay. Right. Right. So yeah. So the, so the lock the mm. lockdown was a single bourbon barrel. Um, it, it just when it, when it first came here, it was it was okay. But um, gee, over the years, it, it um, eighteen months or so that we've had it here, it's um, yeah, it's improved a lot. In fact, it was getting very close to um, I, what it's, I'd say it's peaked. It's it's amount of wood that's got in it. So you know, when I when I know that it, it, it's yeah, the first thing that hits me is that um, that the American oak, that bourbony, bourbony wood wood note, and um, I, I just just love love that. That's just me. You know, I just love that that those bourbon notes in um in, in a malt in a malt whiskey um but yeah that's it, it that we, we yeah just trying to think think of the tasting notes of it there, yeah they said bourbony wood, woody notes um yeah uh, the, the other one the, the other one we've called x you know is is a very very prune juice one i i think but no this this one and what i really like about the bourbon barrels is um the, a really good one to me is has got um Lovely coconut macaroons. That's what I, I love about it. And this one really, really hits that coconut, coconut macaroons. That's the way I describe it anyway. Um, this is at cast strength. Even though, even though you probably re look on your sample, it's only about 44%, is it? Um, which is the natural cast strength that this thing came here. And I suspect, I don't really know for sure, but I suspect that um, some of the whiskey was decanted and sold because it was a pretty good barrel and it was filled back up with water. Um, I can't be sure that's the case, but um, I suspect that's that's what happened. But we found out that quite a lot of those low ABV barrels are really, really nice. And um, yeah, this is um, yeah, this is certainly one of well, there's not a huge amount of them, but they, there are there are a few in there that were, that were really nice. Um, but yeah, now if you like that American oak, um, fresh wood note, um, that coconut, that, that's lovely sweet notes, then. Um, yeah, this is this is a beautiful whiskey, and I believe it sold out on your website there very very quickly. 
Well, it went for sale on Thursday night because it's a Whiskey Lovers Ex- Australia Facebook group exclusive. Uh, it all sold out. We, we did keep 15 bottles back for the show tonight, so it's available in our store in the app now. So uh, anyone who missed out, jump on and grab a bottle. The the sample you set up, us, uh, Pete, to, to decant in for the show, um, we, we obviously got it a few weeks ago. Um, we've let it oxidate a bit, and to me, uh, I'm getting tons of fruit tingles uh, come through on the front palate. It, it's just become super sweet and Moorish, and, and yeah, I love it. It's my favorite remnant yet. Yeah, got to, we all have different ways of describing the same flavor, but there. Yeah. yeah, fruit tingles, I can see where you're coming from there. Yes. Mm. It just, just reminds me of that, that first flavor when you jump on the on the gum there. But yeah, there's a few other comments coming through. The, the other sample, uh, Pro, uh, sample X, which I imagine will come out soon as a Christmas cake nose. We're getting a few other comments here. Uh, solid, hey, great. Um, and and obviously, uh, you got fans of the Bogan burnout, but this uh, <laughs> this uh, lockdown is a uh, you know leagues ahead. Any any yeah. exciting um, news coming up for Remnant? Um, well, we we're just starting to work on the next big blend. We've got the the. Um, the, the one with the devil on the on the front, the, the scoundrel. That's that's pretty well all sold out, I think. Might be a few around bottle shops somewhere, but um, yeah, we, we've sold all our stock out of it. Um, the fly by night. That was the next batch that we had. That was a, a much much bigger batch. Yeah, we've got quite a lot of that at the moment. Really, and just starting to push that at the moment. And we're going to release that in two different bottle sizes, seven hundreds and five hundreds. Yeah, there's some people who complain that oh they don't want five hundred mil bottles. They want something decent, you know, decent amount doesn't last long enough so we, we don't give the people the option this time of the, the fly by night at 500 or 700 mils um then we have these odd little releases now and again mainly for you guys on the whiskey list um then, then we have another another um, batch we're starting to put together now we, we selected about um sampled about 50 barrels only, only a couple of days ago so we we start very starting very early stages on another blend of those um yeah, blend. You know, there's there's two two thoughts. You know, we we do single barrels or we do blends. And um, certainly these these Nant ones, there weren't very many. Um, whoops, I said the name. The, these weren't there weren't very many um, single single barrels there that were any good. But yeah, luckily we got one here in this bourbon. But but um, yeah, blending them together and and look, blending whiskey is great fun. It's 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 hard work. It takes a long long time, but it's um, really good fun. I've got somebody who's got a fantastic palate to help me and. Um, he does the initial um, initial work, and then we sit down together, and you know, with half a dozen leftover, uh, well, final ones, and work out which how they're going to work. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I have great fun. You now, even the other people might like to do this. Um, I often sit down, and I've got five different, totally different whiskies sitting next to my chair while I'm watching TV, and I pour a little bit of this, a little bit of that into the into the into my glass, and um, yeah, just do my own little blends every night, nearly. And um, I do the same thing with wines too. That um, yeah, blending is great fun. Um, but anyway, yeah, we should get back to this. But oh, the, the yeah, this is this is lovely. It's interesting that you know when the first show started tonight, you know, a bit over an hour ago, I had a little taste of these, and and um, I wasn't. I thought I just can't get the flavours out of these. But uh, they sit here, sat here in the glass, and and um, I, I think the big problem is that it's so cold here tonight. <laughs> it's not really really cold, but it, the flavours just don't come out for a start. They they need a really good warm up to, to get the flavours out, and but uh, they they're really yeah, they really Someone, jumped. Someone's yeah. just uh, commented the blending's hard, but the the drinking's easy. So I totally <laughs> agree. Yep. Awesome, David. Any any questions or comments from your side? No, just just uh, thinking, Pete, while you were talking, that um, now obviously there's uh, there, there's a finite number of these casks. Uh, does that mean that there's a, uh, a a lifespan of the remnant brand, or have you got plans for extending that with other casks that you're busy on uh, searching for? Yeah, we've got a couple of options for the future. It won't, it certainly, it won't be the end of, end of the remnant name. Um, one thing is that I'll start at Belgrave. We'll, I'll start making whiskey for our, our remnant company. Uh, new, new make and start um, yeah, put, putting that down. And also, you know, we might try to buy uh, barrels from other businesses who decide that just selling is too hard because actually really selling the whiskey is the hardest part of the job. And um, so we, we might um, yeah, buy barrels from uh, distilleries who... who um, who don't want to go to the trouble of bottling and um, or blending and bottling and selling it themselves. So we might just start buying right. cars as well. I hope hope we don't have to buy them from other businesses that go broke. That um, we certainly don't want to see that happen again. But um, 
yeah, if anybody wants to sell us barrels in the future, we, we probably, um, we certainly consider it. It's a fantastic example of uh, industry collaboration. Um, and uh, it's, uh, I think it's something that's uh, quite, uh, quite unique to, uh, in terms of New World whiskies. Uh, that's what's happening down here. I think uh, you guys are certainly leading the world in that, uh, uh, in, in, in that field. And uh, I think at some point we're going to have to have a showdown between uh, uh, Remnant and Flurio in terms of uh, innovative uh, whiskey names. <laughs> uh, well, well, our, our next one, um, I, I hope I can, others aren't going to get upset, but the next one is called um, Heard Not Seen. So if you know what happened to the guy that um, made the original one, he went on to another investment business. <laughs> Cattle. <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. Awesome. Well, you're getting some really good feedback and the Sample X is uh, tasty as well. And you got some uh, some international fans. Uh, Sir Peter, I, I don't know if it's a... <laughs> Well, if you're recent, uh, you know, cooking adventures of, uh, what is it, uh, Gordon Ramsay when he visited. But, uh, yeah, Hi. there's a lot of international fanfare that's uh, starting to follow you guys around. But uh, it's great. Uh, Tassie Whiskey's on the on the scene, on the map, and on, on the go. So, Cameron, uh, Spring Day might hand over to you. Let's talk us uh, this um, Whiskey Show exclusive bottling, uh, the American Virgin Oak. Well, um, thanks, Ollie, and uh, Gay to everyone who's out there. And it's... Uh, I just wish I had one of the kits tonight. It's uh, rather unfortunate I don't actually have one here because I'd love to have tried these whiskies that the uh, the other guys have been talking about. Um, one thing that's really exciting for me is is that when we first started, actually we had our sixth birthday on Wednesday. And if I look back to our very first releases, our first two releases were into bourbon cask. And that was, for me, I suppose, inspired a little bit by the Sully's Black Label, which has always been one of my favourite releases of theirs. And, and we always thought from the start that uh, bourbon cask is un, underrated in Australia, uh, primarily because we, we get this sort of, um, I don't know, we've been taught that uh, bourbon cask out of Scotland is, is inferior and all of their premium whiskies have been finished in some special uh, sherry cask. So, so I think what, what's really exciting, like I loved hearing from Jade and Mark about their... Um, their next bourbon release is really exciting for me. I love the fact that uh, Hobart are doing as their signature a bourbon cask because I think what Tasmania is sort of doing at the moment is we're releasing some really good bourbon casks and I'd love to have tried that uh, remnant tonight that uh, Peter was talking about. And so for us, we were always excited by how much flavour you can get out of a bourbon cask if it's, if it's done well and it's not a, a sixth fill or a seventh fill that some of these ones coming out of Scotland might be. Um, so what we did because uh, we're only six years old and still learning, is that just over two years ago, we put down a couple of 50-litre casks. One was a virgin American oak and the other was a virgin French oak. And really what I wanted to see, this is really a lesson for, for us at Spring Bay more than anything else, was to see what the actual virgin oak brings to the palate in comparison to whether you actually have an American oak bourbon or, say, a port or a sherry French oak. So... Um, what we want to do is we're sort of timing these for a release around um, Tasmania Whiskey Week, which is sort of happening sort of uh, in the second week of August. And I'm really sorry that those poor people from Sydney are, are going through what they're going and not going to be able to make it this year. Um, so uh, we're certainly two, looking two forward to Two years in a row. Two years in a yeah, row. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's, you know, this COVID thing, I think we're all over it really, aren't we? Um, anyway, but uh, so, I'm, so what I've done is um, I've given you a, like a bit of a sneak preview um, and uh, all of your members, a bit of a sneak preview of this American oak. Now, our intention was to actually release it at um, 46%, so it can be sort of um, parallel tasted with our bourbon cask. So, you know, you have the bourbon and you can actually then see what the uh, virgin American oak. Now, what we found though, because it's a first fill and we gave these casks a heavy char, and as I said, they're only a 50 litre cask. So the extraction has been pretty heavy. And as you can see, I've I've got a bit of a sample here. I mean, for, for American oak, it's huge extraction, great colour. Look at that colour. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it was quite a surprise when we pulled it out. And uh, uh, your team there, including yourself, Oliver and Chris and David, I think uh, the decision was to, uh, to release it at 58%, which I'm, I'm not unhappy about. Um, it basically means you can play around with the whisky. And I certainly recommend, I mean, this whisky... I have to admit, it's probably not the best whiskey the Spring Bay has ever made. It's a, it's an experimental whiskey. Um, the French oak, I think, is probably um, a little bit more sort of easy on the palate. This just smacks you in the head because it's the first fill um, virgin oak. 
I think the second fill for this barrel will certainly be a, be a lot more gentle and a bit, bit more Spring Bay-like. But for us, this was an experiment, something fun to do, um, being six years in. And we just wanted to see, you know, what it would be like to actually uh, do a little bit of this uh, uh, virgin oak. But I suppose I've actually got a question for uh, all the people who are out there tonight and maybe our panel here. If we refill this barrel, would it still be virgin oak? Mm -hmm. So there's something to think about. If it's had our spirit in it before, is it still a virgin? Well, quick question. For those kind of at home and new to whiskey, what does virgin oak actually mean? Maybe first start with there. Well, uh, for us, I mean, our interpretation of that is that uh, I mean, it, it hasn't had any other spirit or liquid in it prior because everyone knows that, you know, most casks that uh, whiskey distillers use have either had port or sherry or bourbon. These are actually um, basically milled almost like what a um, bourbon maker would use to make their bourbon uh, in America under their laws. It has to go into virgin cast, hasn't had anything else in it. We gave these a heavy char. Um, and uh, that's why we've got such uh, such great extraction out of it. But um, for me, it's really interesting just to see, taking the bourbon out of the equation, what we're left with. And uh, it is like uh, Peter described, the coconut. It, it is, it's like a, basically, if you take a vanilla slice, blend it with a really strong pina colada, that's pretty much what this whiskey is for me. It's, a, it's got heaps of sweetness to it. It's not as complex, um, and it doesn't have that fruitiness, I think it was really interesting hearing you talk about fruit tingles before. Our second release was described by the Australian Financial Review of uh, having a really nice uh, sort of fruit tingle effect to it, uh, which is an old Maker's Mark barrel. That's the thing that for me is missing out of this whiskey. It doesn't have those sort of that fruitiness that uh, bourbon can bring. Um, however, it is interesting to have, have a try of something that, that it is virgin, actually to see what the barrel's bringing. A couple of, couple of initial impressions that, that I'm getting is uh, it's a bit of aniseed and mint as well. Yeah, I certainly agree with you. I, I did. I probably got more licorice than aniseed. Um, I know they're fairly similar, but but I certainly agree with you. And I get that from a couple of our whiskies um, from time to time. And it's it's not um, certainly not unpleasant, but it's interesting. Adds an interesting character, which which thankfully you know we're getting a little bit of character out of these virgin barrels. I thought they might be a bit one dimensional, but it's certainly got a nice long finish to it. But it certainly is. Uh, it's it's quite brave using uh, the s small virgin oak barrels, uh, cause as you said, they, they can be unpredictable, and uh, a, a bit a bit like a bit like a puppy that you're letting loose in the park for the first time. <laughs> yeah, well, David, it, it was it was a bit of a as I said, it was an experiment. I didn't want to waste too much spirit on a on an experiment, but <laughs> typical of Spring Bay, we we sort of find some casts that are quite interesting for those that have might have tried our Chardonnay uh, or our Pinot cast. You know, absolute. You know mistake of, of uh, and I'm going to put my hand up that uh, that it was it was my fault these these whiskey some of these whiskies in the past have tasted really good at about two years and um, that would have been the time you'd think to actually lay some more of those down but uh, we waited mm -hmm. till our bottle before we went hey they're actually pretty good whiskies we better get some more of those casks so so uh, I don't know whether we're going to be doing too much virgin cask uh, in the future but it's certainly something we did it more of an internal experiment just to see really for our own palate what our spirit does uh, with the casks and if we take bourbon out of the equation, what does the virgin oak actually uh, bring, whether it be French or, the, uh, in this case, the American? But I love American oak, so, so I don't think you can go wrong with that. It's that distiller's dilemma of when, when do you put more casts down. But whiskey, whiskey is my jam at home, uh, says, I think Nant was the only other Tassie virgin oak. I think theirs was white oak released to date. Is anyone here can confirm that? Maybe Peter? Is there yeah, any other um, virgin Tassie Yeah, the white oak, I, I certainly remember that. Yeah, I, I think we're dropping out the internet. I don't know if it's my end or your end or what it is. We're losing the signal from time to time. But, yeah, the white oak, I was certainly familiar with that one. I, I wasn't a great fan of it at the time. Maybe I might have changed my mind now if I heard another sample of it. But, um, yeah, I hadn't, hadn't heard of any other distillers using virgin oak. But, um, yeah, there may, there may have been. Well, we did, we did a 20-litre barrel about three years ago. Um, and it, it pretty much went straight away. It was it was actually you know, quite good. But again, coming out about that uh, question, it was actually um, it was a gift from uh, Redlands Distillery to um, to one, one of our um, uh, famous coopers down here in Tasmania, Adam Bones, for his wedding. So it had Redlands spirit in it. Then Adam gave it to me as a present. We put Spring Bay spirit in it. So I ended up in a debate in uh, Whiskey and Ailment uh, Bar in Melbourne about whether it's actually still qualifies the Virgin Oak Barrel if it's had whiskey spirit in it. 
Um, I think for us, we'd probably still consider if we refill this cask, I'd be interested to see because we had so much extraction the first time. It'd be interesting to see if it's a bit more gentle uh, the second time around. You, uh, I'd probably still consider it virgin oak. Have you refilled it or is that tomorrow's problem? Um, well, actually, to be honest, you've actually got a sneak sample there. We haven't actually decanted it. So it's the, the whiskey is still in the barrel because um, it's actually, I call it a work in progress. It's, it's officially whiskey on the 2nd of August. So, so we can't bottle it till after that. So hence you don't have any of it on, uh, on your website at the moment. But we're going to do a bit of a limited bottling for Taz Whiskey Week. And really, as I said, it was an experimental barrel that we wanted to do as a parallel tasting with our bourbon cask. And so I think it might be interesting when we get its uh, sister cask, the French oak, which we laid down at the same time with the same spirit, um, is uh, is due for um, decanting. So we'll do that as a parallel tasting with, uh, I reckon, probably some sherry uh, or a port cask. Yeah, awesome. You're getting quite a good uh, bit of feedback. Uh, finish really last, Everlasting Gobstopper. There you go. That's that's a that's a new one. I haven't heard that one before. Yeah, no, I agree with I agree with them. It uh, it does. It, I mean, that's the good thing about American oak. It does does give you a really good finish, and it does last for uh, especially at fifty eight percent. It probably. Uh, you know, I think, you know, with the last whiskey of the night, and I think it's probably going to be um, uh, still going for, ne for the next five minutes after you've tasted it. It's, it's, oh, I'm still getting a really nice uh, long finish on the on the mouthful I had about five minutes ago. And we've got a request for uh, whoever does the next Virgin Oak release in Australia, please uh, <laughs> name it with a Madonna reference. Uh, you know, we've got a few <laughs> few examples of Virgin Mary, etc., coming through. But, uh, yeah, there, there's plenty of... Uh, Good naming choices. Seems what I actually wanted to ask to, to all four of you. Um, obviously, like we've got a lot of great Australian ex wine casts, a lot of everyone's doing it, but uh, all four of you have got you know some sort of bourbon release, ex bourbon cast release coming out soon or out now. Is there a shift of Tasmanian whiskey moving in that direction? Like, or is this just happenstance that you all like bourbon casks? So, wh where's this coming from? Um, John, um, uh, go, 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 ladies, poor gentlemen, go, Jane. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that um, we used to have a, a bit of bourbon for Overeem, um, and as of June next year, we're going to have bourbon fit into our core range. So every every port sherry uh, barrel yes. put down is bourbon. So that's what you're going to see from yeah. next year. So there won't be that's a shortage. That's great, Jane for next year. I'm really glad to hear that. I'd love to see Tasmania become known uh, for bringing bourbon cask back as actually a premium uh, whiskey. And I, th yeah. I think it has been underrated. And I think we're discovering, uh, uh, I think that one of the key things for me is that Tasmanian distillers make really good new make spirit. Mm -hmm. And I think the bourbon cask actually puts that on show. And I think often we've hidden a lot of our really good spirits behind some uh, heavily fortified whiskies because we've been trained that the, the premium whiskies um, go into fortified barrels, you know, they're the most expensive barrels. And of course, Scotland have, have taught us that their premium whiskies are either come out of a PX or an Oloroso uh, sherry cask, even as a finisher. So what it does is, and I'm, I'm really happy to hear Jane and Mark say that, because what we're doing is we're actually letting our spirit shine a bit more out of Tasmania. And I think that's the one thing that we do really well. And I think, uh, I mean, I was told when I did the first, our first release in the bourbon cask that I was very brave and being a, a naive uh, distiller back in 2015, I didn't realise how naked our spirit would be and we're just fortunate that, um, you know, using a Peter Bailey still actually makes quite a good spirit. So so uh, we're fortunate that even though our spirit was naked, it's quite good. So so I reckon go go bourbon cast for Tasmania. I think it's really a really good thing. That's our spirit thing. Yep. Yep. Love it. Yeah, I remember um, yeah, quite a few years ago going into Casey Overeem's Bond store and um, he gave me a sample of the, the bourbon cast and I thought, oh, wow, wow, this is really really nice and um yeah it certainly i think it certainly shows up the spirit better than the than the fortifieds um yeah. interesting i've got a couple of these uh barrels from these investor barrels from the other distillery that um they didn't sell them to us i'm just uh, finishing them off for them and they've been um, finished in um, a musket cask one of them and um and a sherry cask the other one and uh, really it's actually it's hidden the, the spirit, which which it probably did want hiding. But um, you know, it, it turned up. Yeah, that that um, that, that uh, the previous session with the mainlanders, it was one of them. There, I can't remember who it was now. That had a um, one that Oliver re referred to as a dessert uh, whiskey, and I think that's what these are. Yeah, you know, they're yeah, you know, they're absolutely delicious. Even though they really aren't almost not whiskies anymore, but 
drinking at the right drinking at the right time by the right people you know it, it, they are really really delicious they're but they're overpowering the spirit but um you know these the bourbon casts they don't overpower it you know you, we can still yeah. taste the base spirit and um yeah no, they just remembered that casey's one day years ago how, how lovely it was um and, and so you know some of my um belgrade rise now I'm, I'm doing them in um in in bourbon casts and um oh, the, the, the rye and the bourbon casts are going really really well but yeah, we, we just produce lots and lots of different flavours. I'm not after a particular style, but yeah, just interesting. Yeah, keep keep it interesting. Keep the different ones coming along. Yeah. Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, we've all mentioned it a couple of times already, but I'm gonna I'm gonna put up the the link to the website now. Uh, you're all involved in Tasman <coughs> Week in some capacity. It's on in eight days time. Uh, tell us what your distillery is doing, please. Uh, let, let's share the love. Um, who wants to jump in first, John? Maybe yeah. yourself. John, yeah, okay, so Taz Whiskey Week, it's um it's coming up. It's terrifying to think it's only eight days away. Um I'm actually on the Taz Whiskey Week committee, but feel like I contribute very little. Uh look, it's gonna be a good week, plenty of events. There's um still a few tickets to some of the events. Uh myself, I'll be involved in a Thursday night event of uh Barrel Finishes Masterclass at the Gold Bar. Uh Friday night is a meet the maker event. Saturday is a showcase, it's a typically a pretty big event, so Looking forward to hopefully some people being able to get into the state and come along and enjoy it. And then on the Sunday night as well, I think there's a, another event at Evolve. Um, I haven't got all the details yet, but I believe Cam might be involved in that one as well. Uh, there's a couple of I other think so. I don't know, John. I've got I've got a list of calendar events. I don't know where I am. I just wait till Susie can tell me where I'm, where I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you just roll on like 80 unread emails and just sort of chip away at them like I do. I mean, it's... it's, it's right. Um, earlier in the week, there's a couple of really good events that uh, I would urge people to get along to. There's a dram and drawer event. There's um, a new make night at um, at the Glass House, I believe, with some up and coming distilleries, which will be a lot of fun. Uh, but it, look, it's a great event for everybody to get along to. Uh, it's a very close community of distillers and distilleries down here, so it's a, just a good excuse for us all to catch up and have a drink and um, share the whiskey love as well. But if you haven't got tickets and you're able to get down here, then absolutely get onto it. Uh, can I just say, um, Ollie, that, that one of the things that I find really exciting about Taz Whiskey Week, each year we're adding new distilleries to the lineup. And I think there's going to be over uh, 20 Tasmanian distilleries at the showcase. And if each one of them has maybe one or two whiskies, you know, it's pretty good value. You're getting about 40 or 50 whiskies on the night. So look out, drink plenty of water. But I mean, for me, like this is an exciting time to be in, in the whiskey industry. I mean, we're 30 years in now for Tasmania. And for me, this is almost like being in Scotland in 1840. I mean, we've got this emergence of all these uh, new distilleries. Our flavor profiles, you know, we're starting to see quite a diversity of uh, different flavors coming out of the Tasmanian distilleries as they mature and find their feet. You know, every year there's always something interesting with Taz Whiskey Week. You know, it's not. You know, imagine if going to a Taz, you know, or a Scottish Whiskey Week where you, you've got Glenfiddich and you've got, you know, all the all the old guys there, you know, with the same sort of whiskies. But every year at Tasmania, we've got new distilleries, we've got new uh, whiskey styles. You know, we'll be showcasing our Virgin American, also our Virgin French, and amongst other things. I know the other guys have got some interesting releases coming out. So, but every year there's always something different. So for me, it's always exciting, to, even for my own um, benefit. I wander around the showcase and meet a lot of the new um, distilleries and see what they're doing. There's always something interesting coming out. So uh, it's always exciting. It's, it's, it's such a great event. It's a great party for all of us distillers. We, we work bloody hard. We're always uh, cleaning. Uh, I mean, doing this is about 1% of our job, which is the best bit. Um, so for us, it's like a party for us. We get together and we can try each other's whiskies and, uh, and we basically invited uh, the country to the party. So, uh, so I'm sorry the New South Wales can't come down. I think we just heard that Queensland can't come down. But uh, I'll tell you what, we'll save you some whiskey for 2022. How does that sound? Yeah, please. You're getting a, a lot of love um, just sharing some of these comments here. Some people, uh, yeah, bittersweet, we can't make it. Um, ben, mm -hmm. I think he calls it best week of the year. It's, uh, it's a, definitely a fun time. Cam, there is a virtual session this year. Mm -hmm. Yes, there, there'll be a virtual session as well. Um, don't ask me when it is. Have a look at the program. Yeah, <laughs> <no worries. laughs> uh, it's, it's, there's so much on. I, I couldn't actually tell you off the top of my head, but uh, there, there is a virtual uh, show again, which thankfully, um, but again, we can't have the thousands of people uh, participating in that, unfortunately. But uh, a few lucky uh, ticket holders will get, I think there's 12 distilleries and 12 different uh, single malts going out uh, across the country. 
And that was great fun last year. I mean, even though it was COVID, we're all in lockdown uh, and it's still an enjoyable thing. Uh, I probably won't have Bill and Lynn Lark around to our house this year. That got a little bit out of control last year. So so I'm, I'm, go I'm going to avoid that. I'll probably lock myself in the distillery somewhere and, uh, and hide. Um, but, uh, you know, it's... Uh, Christy Lark uh, has been doing a lot of the heavy lifting. She's our vice president of the Tasmania Whiskey and Spirits Association. She does an amazing job with John, uh, who's also um, on our um, committee down here in Tassie, uh, does some, a lot of great work. Uh, Jane, she invented it uh, with uh, Christy, Christy back in the day. Um, I know Peter is also going to be involved. Um, so... Um, you know, it, it is one of those things. It is a bit of a, a team effort and a lot of fun. So we're looking forward to it. Mark, what's, um, what's happening at Overing? Yeah, good question. Um, I'll probably get this wrong, but I'll have a crack. Um, <laughs> Jane, Jane will correct me if I'm wrong anyway, right. I think. So. I think Monday we're, we're part of the Whiskey Trivia up at Boodle Beasley. Trivia, yeah. In North Hobart, fun. which should be fun. Um, yeah, there's still a Nicky's going up to... Um, to, to enjoy that event and then I think when well Wednesday we've got our experience over him sort of uh, it's just a it's a guided tasting uh, match with food through our core range of whiskies um, and then Thursday we've got you've got a dinner you're oh, presenting at a dinner uh, Annalise Gregory dinner Annalise Gregory that's it yeah, at yeah. a sheen I believe yeah which that'll, um, be, lots that'll be really nice yeah. um, and then we've got the showcase Saturday but we're also doing tours Monday Wednesday and Friday. Friday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We've got to check the calendar too. It's a big see? week. It'll be fun. <laughs> Lots of fun. So I've, I've posted the link below, taswhiskeyweek.com, 9th to 15th of August. Jump on, uh, share the whiskey love. Someone shared before. It's a great comment. Really important question that Zach has just posted earlier. I forgot to put it up. Uh, but I'll share it now, is a 70% requirement to be bold if you're involved in whiskey. It's called growing a forage, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that is quite funny. Now, it's nothing to do with the single malt whiskey. Don't be afraid, everyone. You won't go bald if you drink single malt whiskey. I was, uh, I was starting to go bald before that happened. But, uh, you know, I think, I think what happens... Like I put my glasses on my head, so that wears a bit. But I think often we're scratching our head, wondering what to do next. And I think that's what happens. So, Jane, be careful about that. I mean, you've got a good head of hair. Don't yeah. you? Know, yeah. It's, it's one of those so things we're, we're always wondering. But, you know, basically, you know, it's really great to see how many women are actually coming into our industry, speaking of hair. I mean, it, it pretty much was an old bugger, um, bald guy's uh, domain there for a while. But now we're getting, I think we've just completed a survey. There's something like, 34% of our uh, distillers in Tasmania or people who work in distilleries are female. Wow. Uh, we'd love to see that. It's pretty good, isn't it? So we'd love yeah. to see that go to about 50%. Mm. At, the, at the moment, I think it's maybe 5% or something or 7% in, in Scotland. Um, and we've got a very high participation rate of women. So I think uh, more, more of them is better. Great. You'll see left bald guys. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's a really good point, and um, yeah, especially to see second generation distillers like Jane and even Christy um leading um yeah, yeah completely on on the global scale. It's uh, it's fantastic to see Tazzy's um you've definitely carved out your little your little piece of the world there. Everyone's uh, demanding more, so please uh, keep making the good stuff. Yeah, we're in the second, we're in the second generation. My um, yeah, I, I started, and uh, one of my sons a brewer, and T Bone, and also my other son Dane. He's um involved with a with the with the remnant, so even though they're not actually distilling, but yeah, they're still in, in the industry. Awesome. Yeah, it's, that's great to see. It's a big family business and, and big growing family. Uh, one comment I just wanted to highlight from Michael on YouTube. He said the best part of a whiskey show in Sydney earlier this year was to meet the distillers session afterwards. So it was great to meet and drink with all of you. And I think that's the whole premise of this, David. Right? Was why you you know bring us all together to, to drink whiskeys, not only to enjoy it, but actually meet the makers and, and to do, you know, the second virtual Aussie whiskey show tonight. It's just been fantastic to actually spend some time with all of you and, and get to know you and hear what's coming next. And yeah, it's been fantastic. Thank you. And, and David, any sort of closing remarks? I think and that, that's, that's very pertinent. And the, uh, the one thing that we realized, and, and uh, I think it was at this uh, Aussie w virtual show last year that we pointed out that uh, it's, it's a, a a golden era for Australian distilleries with COVID around because the guys from around the world can't travel, they can't come visit, 
and you guys got a um, fantastic opportunity uh, where people are, are hungry to to interact with the guys that actually make the stuff that they enjoy and that they're buying the bottles and that um, uh, it's it's really an opportunity for the Australian industry to to showcase itself uh, with the with the local drinkers uh, because that we, yeah we can talk to guys around the world virtually uh, because they're not going anywhere either but when it comes to face to face uh, interaction uh, it's it's all you guys so uh, so keep it up uh, the guys are, are hungry to uh, uh, to be with you guys in whatever forum they they can and uh, we look forward to being uh, hopefully uh, in Tassie as soon as we can. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. Awesome. Thank On that you. note, uh, yeah, thank you so much to everyone. Thank you for sharing your whiskey with us. Uh, Tom, I just pulled up the comment. Uh, great to taste some of the best whiskey in the world. I, I couldn't agree more. And if you can, support your, your, your Aussie distilleries. Go down to Tassie Whiskey Week. Uh, it's on, like we said, in eight days' time. And, yeah, can't wait to, to catch up in person with all of you um, hopefully soon. And, and if not, see you for the next virtual Aussie Whiskey Show. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Ollie. See you guys next yeah, time. Thanks, Ollie and David. Thanks, Have everyone. a great night. Cheers.